Thank you, everyone. As Derek said, um, I'm Alvin. I go by they, them, theirs pronouns, and uh, I am a worker owner with Chai Commons. Before we were a worker-owned cooperative, we started right here back in 2018. Uh, so it's going on about four years now since we became a breakout group. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about where we are now as a breakout group. Um, and then prior to that, we're going to just talk a little bit about what got us together, how everything started, and then, you know, where, where we're going to be headed in the upcoming months and years. So this slide just presents like a timeline for how the group as a whole came together, but also some of the events that occurred that uh, we were either present at or took part in or were galvanized by to do the work that Shy Commons does. So uh, for example, uh, we were part of the uh, group that was summoned through a Smart Chicago uh, Collaborative to do the uh, Connect Chicago internet study. Uh, a couple of my other co-owners, uh, uh, Steve Ediger and uh, Nero Yusuf Zai was in on that cohort of people. Um, and then Steve also had another project uh, where he took data that was uh, curated by this organization called Shareable. And he actually started another hack uh, uh, breakout group here at, uh, at Shy Hack Night. And uh, they were able to curate some of that data, which led to what we have as one of our internal or uh, community projects, our, our map. And then uh, we'll just talk a little bit about one more event that was uh, a catalyst for us starting. And that was an event that was uh, co uh, sponsored by Chi Hack Night, uh, Chicago Sustainability Leaders Network, and uh, a uh, church in South Shore. And this particular event, we had a uh, Chi Hack Night goes to the community event. So Shy Hack Night was actually all of us who were here at the time. Most of us went to that event in a church in South Shore. And so that particular event led to us forming the basis for what our second internal project became, which is known as Block Share. And then uh, after we all got together, started doing d things together in different uh, you know, activities, activity groups, we were like, hey, we know we're pretty good as far as, uh, you know, community organizing or doing uh, this type of work that is community focused. But there are a lot of marketable skills that we have that, you know, we could actually form the basis of what could be a consultancy. And so that's what led us to getting together a group of worker owners and consumer owners uh, to form what is known as Shy Commons uh, Cooperative. So the cooperative came after uh, we formed the uh, breakout group. And now we've been registered with the state uh, as a limited worker cooperative association. So let's talk a little bit about our first uh, community project, our Shy Commons directory map. So uh, the map, as I said, started out with data that was uh, curated by Shareable. That data was an extension of what became a breakout group here at, at Shy Hack Night. And we continue to maintain that data. Uh, we are now up to over 800 entities on our map. And uh, what we did was uh, in 2016, we had the... Uh, sharing cities map mapathon uh in a chn breakout group and then the next iteration of the map was our 3.0 version which which came out a couple of years or actually more like four years later uh around 2020 uh with the version number 3.0 and that particular version uh 
is one that is able to be interactive. So before the map was only what we were able to do on the back end, but once the version 3.0 came out, people who actually had a presence on the map can now go in and uh, with our, you know, guidance and assistance, they can now be able to uh, make uh, suggestions as to changes that needs to be made for their particular data to be made more current than what we have it. So it's now uh, basically a living document, if you will, as opposed to a static map just, you know, there on, uh, on the web page. Our next version will be the version 4.0. Uh, this will incorporate some of the mapping efforts that are going around, going on around the world uh, by various entities that we are currently forming relationships with. So when the next map comes out, that body of people who are able to uh, make contributions, make suggestions and make improvements on the map will be global. So we'll, be, we'll go from a regional or uh, local uh, mapping instance into something that you know, can be seen and uh, you know, uh, participated in by people all over the world. So this is our block share uh, community project. So as I said, when we started out, we had our two projects that we dealt with uh, here as a breakout group in Chai Commons. So Blockshare is an instance of building a community owned, operated, and uh, functional Wi-Fi utility. So basically each community in, in Chicago or anywhere else has the opportunity to build its own uh, internet instance from the ground up using block share tools, norms, and uh, expertise from us or from people who are already in the community with the uh, skills and the uh, acumen to be able to, you know, partake in any of the uh, skill sets that it requires to have block share. So um, block share has, for one, a, a GIS mapping instance where uh, we have taken the instance of a local church in South Shore that has a Wi-Fi transceiver on the rooftop. And we were able to check and verify where the signal strength actually uh, is able to extend to. And on the GIS mapping instance, we're able to provide a heat map of where that signal spread is uh, being able to uh, be, you know, uh, received. So uh, this particular map that you see here gives us a graphical instance of where that is. So precisely where we are here is uh, in South Shore along Exchange Avenue. And uh, the, the two darker structures that you see on the map are where we have the actual transceiver and the repeater and uh, antenna for the transceiver. And those two uh, uh, signal uh, devices work in concert to broadcast a, uh, a Wi-Fi uh, you know, uh, instance where people who are in that area of those circles, those, cons uh, semi those two circles, are able to uh, get on the uh, internet using the... Uh, those two uh, antenna instances. What we've also done with Blockshare is that we were able to build a use case for people in the neighborhood uh, to say, how is your internet quality? What do you need to have to make it uh, uh, more uh, you know, uh, reliable, more affordable, and also local? So uh, we were building these use cases for uh, saying, let's take this out to the community, let's take this out to stakeholders, let's take this out to people who are decision makers to say, these are the people who live here, these are the problems they're having, this is the solution that Blockshare could possibly provide as a means to alleviate what those problems are. 
And then, uh, of course, uh, this particular exercise will be done with people in the community. So we're not trying to go into a community and say, uh, we think we know what your problems are. We're trying to go into a community and say, what are the problems that you're experiencing? How can this instance of technology be used to uh, bridge the gap that you, that you have or to eliminate the obstacle that you have using block share as a technological solution? The next thing that we've been able to do uh, as part of our collaboration with Shy Hack Night is uh, we participated in the Citywide Digital Equity Council guiding team. So that particular team was assembled by the mayor's office to do community conversations around uh, three aspects. One was uh, what are the uh, shortfalls that communities who are under, under resource as far as internet cap, uh, capacity goes, uh, are they having? What are those uh, gaps that are causing them to, you know, fall behind uh, when it comes to internet access? Or what are those uh, barriers that are there which already exist that are not allowing them to have, you know, full access to you know, internet capacity? Uh, and then the second part of this was uh, the asset mapping. So what are those solutions that those communities may have or are trying to acquire that could solve the problem? And then the third aspect of it was the actual solutions finding. So the solutions finding workshops was you bringing those community members together with people who are in the industry or have uh, some level of technical or technological expertise uh, that is longstanding, but are community based. So bringing those people together back into the communities and saying, these are your uh, uh, solution finders. These are the people who we could uh, partner with, or these are the people in your neighborhood that have a instance of a solution. So let's all uh, form a uh, coalition, if you will, to try to address the problem. We actually just got done con uh, concluding with the last aspect of the uh, Digital Equity Council uh, last week. Another partnership that we were able to form was uh, with a company called the Chicago Area Broadband Initiative, or CABI. CABI is a nonprofit um, that has three different aspects to their uh, programming. They actually are trying to put internet free internet into communities that are underserved. Uh, we're trying to form a partnership with them because they actually have access to the uh, fiber optic uh, backbone or backhaul that the internet really is most reliable having. So a wireless signal is, is great, but if you have the signal that's coming from fiber optic cabling, that's the most reliable one to have. So we are in a partnership uh, conversation with Cabby, uh, thanks to our connection here with uh, Shy Hack Knight. Also, we are in a budding uh, partnership with uh, the University of Chicago's uh, Internet Access and Equity Initiative. And this is a group that's actually done some studies all over the city. Uh, as to what the shortfalls are uh, from one community to the next uh, for internet uh, signal reliability. So they've actually done uh, these studies where you, you put a device on your particular uh, uh, modem that tracks the reliability of your signal. And South Shore is one of those communities, uh, communities like Avondale and uh, I believe Lincoln Park is also involved with this. So they are taking instances from affluent communities and co comparing those with instances that are in underserved communities to see what the you know, uh, basic uh, shortfalls are as it pertains to internet reliability. Um, lastly, we have been able to attract over the last, particularly over, over the last couple of years, even with the pandemic, a very diverse group of 
highly skilled people right here at our, in our breakout sessions. So we've been able to meet some really uh, strong, technologically sound uh, minds working here with, uh, with Shy Hack Night in our breakout sessions. And some of those folks have even gone on to help us with our uh, instances of forming all of the different uh, projects that we uh, just talked about, like our GIS map or our personas. And then we're also going to uh, expand this particular volunteer core to bring in new uh, people with new ideas to continue to grow both of our uh, community projects. Our call to action, if you will. So we know that, uh, you know, as far as our map is concerned, we have a lot of skills that, uh, you know, we, we are able to employ. Um, if you look at the bottom there, we are currently using uh, Python, React, Geo Geographic Information Systems uh, tools, and uh, also user interface design and social science survey design analyses expertise. So those are the different types of uh, skill sets that we currently are in need of, but are also uh, having to uh, employ. Our next one is our block share. Block share continues to evolve as a project. Uh, what we're looking at now is uh, what does a community partnership with block share looks like from a non-technical uh, aspect. So uh, we'll, we will probably be needing volunteers that are people who are more within the social sciences uh, uh, arena along with people who have uh, the technical skill sets, whether it be in building the hardware infrastructure or building the software uh, uh, back end for our server that will be placed in any local community. All of these community instances will have their own server that they can use to uh, communicate with, with one another and also share all of their tools, rides, and uh, skills within the community. So um, as far as our call to action is concerned, for our volunteers, that's what we're looking for. But we also have another call to action. We are a fully fledged consultancy and we're looking for uh, worker owners to join us. We're looking for people with uh, a variety of skill sets that uh, we will basically find job opportunities for. And uh, our worker ownership uh, core is right now uh, in great need of some diversity. So we're particularly looking for uh, women and minority groups, black and brown folks. So uh, if you're interested in doing any of this type of work, uh, please come visit us or you can go on to our shycommons.coop website where we have a join us page and there you'll be able to find a uh, instance for a skill survey that uh, you know you can fill out and we look forward to meeting you if you're interested in finding out more about what we do or interested in uh, contributing to our uh, consultancy projects. Um, that concludes uh, my uh, presentation. I will take questions at this time. Uh, my question is regarding, generally or usually when you work with communities um, and it's a new time or something different and you're trying to really help people, there are also a lot of creative and unique ideas that come out of that. I'm wondering if you can speak about some of those experiences and also how uh, those experiences uh, are protected. You know, how the people actually benefit from their real ideas, from their own ideas, and maybe not exploit it or become someone else's ideal. That kind of autonomy, and also being able to communicate with people uh, that they feel comfortable with and uh, growing. Thank you. Um, first, I'll take the first part of your question and say, that uh, 
you're right. There is a wealth of talent, especially in our underserved communities. And we've, we've met people who are actually trying to do mesh networks in, in different communities around the city. We know of two instances where we've talked to people that are trying to do some of this work. And um, that's the type of talent that we want to partner with. And the second part of your question, um, I can say three words that we truly believe in that I think will answer that question. And those words are, they own it. Shy Commons doesn't own anything. When it comes to us going to a community, we want to be able to share what they have, not, you know, co-opt what they have. We want to be able to share this, their skills. We want to be able to uh, co-build, if you will, uh, any type of, uh, you know, uh, tools that they have, using those tools to co-build something tangible that will be beneficial in, in that particular community. Super quick question. Can you describe the difference? What's a consumer owner versus a, uh, I think you said builder owner? So we have four ownership classes. The, the two that uh, we currently are, uh, you know, have on our roster, on our roles are our worker owners. Those are the people who, as we like to say internally, do the work that keeps the lights on and the doors open. And then you have the consumer owners. Those are the people who uh, want to learn about cooperativism. They want to uh, be able to find out what the experience of a cooperative lifestyle looks like. And eventually we'll be able to benefit from some of our offerings that we have as far as our internal projects, our community projects, or our uh, consultancy. All right. Thank you so much, Alvin. Uh, hi, I'm Sarag. Uh, and yeah, uh, I generally go to Decart My State when we break out into prayer rooms. So I'm here to talk to you guys about it. Uh, I've been coming to Shy Hack Night for like six months now. So maybe not the longest, but I've worked through Decart My State. As the name sounds, uh, we deal in the realm of climate change. We want to real uh tell people what they can do and how they can do it uh to like make climate change not a thing so yeah big bold letters climate change once again climate change it's here and scary and yeah so this is where we are uh the black part is where we are right now and all of the curves are where we're going. Uh, this is for the next, up to the next century, so up to 2100. These are uh, projected increases in global temperature. And I'm sure as many of you have heard, uh, any increase by even a single degree is not good. Uh, so yeah, uh, the top one is with current policies and actions what uh, would happen that's targeting about 3% increase. Uh, the purple one is um, with like what, uh, like the UN and what sort of uh, targets they have. It's a two and a half percent increase, uh, degree increase. And then as we uh, go down. So this graph shows that uh, we're not out of the water. Like our current target targets, which are this one, it's still going to increase degrees, uh, global average temperatures by two and a half degrees, which is not acceptable. That that will lead to the apocalypse. Well, basically the apocalypse. So, but it it's not all gloom and doom. Like these top things up here, they don't have to happen. We can bend the curve down to more normal uh, temperature increases. Like if we're... Uh, more active in our policies if we're better with uh, decarbonizing. So uh, our approach to climate change, we have to decarbonize. What does that mean? It means machines give off emissions. Whenever you burn fossil fuels, whenever you use natural gas, whatever, you're putting more carbon in the air, emissions. So these are like your power plants, your heaters, your boilers, your stoves, your cars. 
we want to get rid of that to reduce our emissions to zero. So you want to take that power plant and those cars and turn it into wind turbines or solar panels and electric vehicles because those are cars that won't give off. Uh, those are appliances that won't give off emissions. They're appliances that will help us reach our goal of being uh, net zero by 2050. So what we're doing when we're taking your furnace, turning it into a heat pump, when we're taking your uh, uh, gas guzzling car and turning it into an EV, when we take your uh, power plant and shut it down and give you some solar panels, that's called clean electrification. That's uh, the top part here. There is some other stuff, which is like your farms, like you hear that cows poop and uh, that gives off methane and all that. That does happen, but that's not as easily fixable as what we have up there with some clean electrification. So in making our site decarb this, I would decarb my state, we had three goals to break down the source of CO2 emissions by state, which is what that graph you saw on the previous page was. Uh, it is to explain what their state needs to do, which is part of what that graph is. So uh, certain states, especially those... Um, that are more rural, maybe not. They don't, might not have any power plants, so maybe they need to focus on taking their cars and uh, making them more, uh, making getting a high percentage of electric vehicles, or d depending on the state. And then the last one is to give them specific calls of actions. Uh, people always hear that oh, climate change is an issue, but no one really knows what should I do about climate change. And that's a that's something that we wanted to say. Oh, you can do specifically this, or you can contact this person. The site's audience is the people who not only have the means, but they have the desire to do something about climate change. It's, we're not trying to convince people that climate change is real. We're past that at this point. You can't convince deniers who just won't care. You have to actually go into, uh, you have to go into the problem with a solution. And that's what we're doing. We're giving them a solution. We take all the data we have from all the sources and we turn them into graphs. The graph on the left over there is a state breakdown. I believe, yeah, that is Illinois. So as we can see, Illinois uh, is fairly balanced, which I don't know if that's a good thing in this case, but it's fairly balanced. So maybe we need a transport would be your uh, gas cars. Maybe we need to turn those into electric vehicles. Power, your power plants. Maybe we need to become Indiana and make a bunch of wind turbines. Uh, buildings would be like your heating and your furnaces. Maybe we need to worry about that. So we wanted to show them what uh, the problems are and then how far along are we to fix them? Because you can have a bunch of power shoes and have a million solar panels. That's still a thing. So here, Illinois is kind of there for buildings, nowhere there for EVs and not really close for all the stuff. So we take all this data and we do it for every state. So on the website, you'll be able to click into any state you want, uh, any US state, sorry, Germany, uh, any US state you want and uh, be able to like learn about them and figure them out. But with this data, there you need to have stuff to do with that. So we have two calls to action mainly. The first one, the first one more obviously is to electrify your machines. So we want to take those three categories of transportation, of power, and of Building. bu buildings. <laughs> that, yes. And of buildings. And we you want to actually do something. Maybe, like I said, buy an electric vehicle or get a heat pump or build solar panels. So that's one of your options. Uh, another one is to talk to your local politician because... Climate change legislation is hard to come by because lobbyists. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, get political. Uh, the climate cabinet uh, gives a lot of politicians a score on how well they are regarding climate change. And, like, you can go to the website and figure out, like, especially with um, voting, voting, yeah, elections. That's what I'm like. Elections coming up soon. You can probably find a uh, vote for people who are more likely to not hate the environment. All this is a decarb my state.
Today is officially the second release of Decar My State. So please go. Other than that, uh, we aren't just working on Decar My State. Uh, last July, Victor and Derek gave a talk. And since then, what's happened? The IRA passed. This is when you clap. So what's the IRA? The IRA is the Inflation Reduction Act. It got passed on uh, August 12th and is a federal law act that uh, uh, works on inflation. But among, uh, among many other things, they have uh, incentives for EVs, heat pumps, uh, electric panels, and more. So if you go to this QR code, uh, it'll be a calculator for the uh, IRA. You can put in some of your information, like where you live, uh, some of your income, and it'll spit out, oh, what sort of ta tax credits and incentives you will get for um, do, uh, becoming greener. So yeah, you can get money for doing something good for the environment. Uh, I'll leave the QR code up there for like three seconds. Okay. So in other news, uh, energy-wise, uh, we've been, uh, not energy-wise, but we've been scraping 93,000 climate news articles. Why? Because all this data, there's a website called energynews.us, and it holds a bunch of different articles uh, that are email digests sent to uh, subscribers. And it's spread among a, a bunch of different 93,000 articles. And like, this is what an article will look like. So you've got uh, like blurbs based on like what sort of energy uh, topic and what they're doing all over the United States. So we're taking all this information and we're putting it into our Google Doc, uh, Google Sheet, and like tagging them with uh, uh, states and territory territories uh, in, in order to figure out what like energy news trends have been over the past uh, decade. As we can see here, uh, since 2013, solar has consistently been the most uh, prevalent uh, category to exist. And then you've got some oil, coal, climate, climate, and that jazz. So yeah, uh, it's very interesting seeing how, like, how solar energy has stayed constant, but news about other stuff has like fluctuated a lot. Did some topic modeling. So that's where we take some of the blurbs that are with the, um, with the website and we make it so that it, uh, we figure out how they are like grouped together. So Energy, the word, and in this case, the word energy would uh, go with uh, clean and climate and support a lot. Going to hand it off to. Oh, yeah. This is the part where I said I was going to present. So, um, in addition to uh, all the things that Sarag mentioned, um, I've been living this in my single family home in Oak Park. Uh, I've been, uh, as they say, walking the walk in addition to talking the talk. Um, so this is the, the diagram that I think uh, Sarag had on a previous slide. This is from Rewiring America. This is like what the ideal uh, you know, electrified home looks like. And uh, of course, it's like there's a lot of hand waving. It's like just do this and you're done, right? Uh, except it's not that simple in reality. So uh, I decided to go down this path and see what I could do. I have about a hundred year old home, um, and we decided first thing we could do is install solar panels. So this is, this is actually the roof of my house. We actually have solar panels on our house. There's 24 of them. Uh, it it uh, um, does all of the, um, uh, uh, I think it replaces 100% of our current energy uh, uses. So that's awesome. We did happen to, um, yeah, it's kind of maybe one of those things that you maybe didn't think, oh, it's Illinois. It doesn't like get enough sun here. Yes, the sun, sun still shines in Illinois. We still get, I think the stat is like 70% the same sunlight as Arizona. So it's just like anybody who says there's not enough sunlight for this to work, doesn't know what they're talking about. There is. Um, my house isn't particularly big. It just happened to have a nice flat roof on top and we could fit the enough solar panels on there. Um, so uh, did that check. That one was pretty good. Um, uh, you can also see uh, this is the, the the device that measures my solar output, and this is my electric bill. Bloop went to zero. 
Um, this, if you're curious, I know this isn't zero. This is $15. It's because I still have to pay ComEd $15 a month to be connected to the grid. Um, which, I mean, I'll, I mean, it's kind of like lame, but also at the same time, uh, I, you have to draw energy, especially as the winter months come. Like, I'm not going to produce much, as much solar energy in December and January and February. Uh, and so I actually will be drawing uh, some of that energy from the grid. So I still have to be connected. I'm not, like, disconnected from the grid. The uh, next thing I uh, wanted to tackle, like, that was easy, was installing heat pumps. Uh, and it turns out that... Um, I can't just do that because my home is super drafty. This is a blower door test uh, summary. It is super like full of a bunch of numbers that and like acronyms that I don't even understand. But this is good and this is bad and I'm over here. So apparently um, this number of uh, 8.2, like a passive home is 0.5, which is basically like the amount of air that has to get is like it's just being exchanged through just like things going out, like, you know, just like when the windows open, right? Um, you want this to be like 0.5 and mine's at 8.2. So it's very, very drafty because my home is again, hundred years old. As part of this, you could see, uh, this is actually part of the blower door test. This is like someone went around with a, uh, an infrared gun and this is like different places in my house. Dark is bad. Dark means air, like warm air is going out of the house. Uh, and, uh, so I have a lot of insulating to do is what I've learned. Um, so I'm going to continue to be documenting this whole process uh, as I do it. I actually just published a blog post today documenting our solar panel process and how much it costs and how I did it and all the incentives and all that kind of stuff. And I'll uh, keep documenting as we try to do the rest of it as well. The other um, thing that uh, I'll, and before I give back to Sarag is um, Juan Pablo Velez, if anybody was here back in January when he gave his talk that actually inspired our breakout group, uh, he has since started a group called Wind Climate. And Wind Climate um, is a uh, basically a, a data science think tank for climate change. So that he's like bringing in a bunch of volunteers, very much like inspired by the Shy Hack Night model to do like climate modeling and doing different kinds of data processing things. And then actually just published their first report uh, last week uh, on the efficacy of the electrification um, bill that was passed in New York State. Um, so uh, this is you know, this is something that we're continuing to be um, supportive of, uh, and it, it shows us the number of different areas we've sort of branched off into. Um, you want to hit the next one? All right. And then the last thing on our talk for today is uh, we've been working with the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition, the ICJC. Illinois Jobs Coalition, a uh, Clean Jobs Coalition is a, a coalition of people who are working through clean jobs. Uh, <laughs> they were instrumental in passing uh, CJA, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, which is uh, Illinois state uh, legislation that uh, basically promotes um, cleaner jobs and more equitable uh yeah, as it says. Uh, so since he just passed, uh, the number of solar projects, uh, like solar panels anywhere, has exploded from 80 megawatts to 2,000 megawatts in the past year alone. So they contacted us and asked us to make maps about um, uh, about like solar projects throughout the state. And it's very difficult because an increase 20-fold in the number of Solar projects is what we want, but it's hard to track. So we did find one source, and so we're putting that together. And we are going to start geocoding and mapping all 33,000 new solar projects in Illinois. So as I said before, um, this is t uh, today, November 1st, is officially our second release of Decar My State. So take a sticker. And by that mean, I mean Mob Victor, and he will give you 15. So yeah, uh, if you have feedback, uh, there's the decarbonize decarb my state uh, is at this link, and uh, that scraper is at uh, slash energy uh, news roundup, and yeah, I will take questions. Thank you so much for sharing. I. Do you want to cheat a little bit? I have too many questions, if that's okay. 
Um, first question is, how do you measure your impact? And second is, how have you been promoting your website or your organization to gain that impact? Uh, so to your first question, uh, measuring impact like tangibly is difficult because climate change is so large. And so we've been saying like, oh, you can work towards like making a cleaner future, I guess, by like decarbonizing. Do you have like hmm? a tangible? Oh, I mean, I would say as far as like impact, it's so huge. We're going to, if we, even if we're wildly successful, it would probably not even show up on any like measurable thing as far as like number of people, like, you know, amount of emissions, like we're not going to be like making a huge impact there. I would say that by doing this, we've educated ourselves and we've educated all the people in our breakout group. And we have also um, started to work with other groups that do have that higher impact. And so I think honestly, like the website is great. The website's probably going to hopefully inspire maybe some people in this room, um, certainly inspired myself to like decarbonize my own home. We're going to try to spread that as much as we can. But I think honestly, like our tech skills, being able to leverage those to help other groups that are already doing this work is probably our biggest potential benefit to this movement. Um, just because I think that there's folks who've been working on this for decades, right? And we're kind of new and there's, there's, it's much more powerful to connect to groups that are already doing the work and have been deeply rooted in that for, for such a long time. Do you want to add something, Victor? Yes, absolutely. Um, so measuring impact, like Sarag said, is really challenging. I think if, if we were like CJ or something, you could be like, oh, at the state level, this change, like it's modelable. It's not really possible for us, but I think doing all those things. And one of the things we want to do is decarb is also really useful as a thing to talk to your politicians about. We love talking to politicians. And like, I actually ran into my alderman and I talked to him about our project. And I was like, you know about the IRA, you know about these incentives. And he was like, no. And I like told him, I was like, well, all of your constituents can get money for getting these new appliances. So I think it's like getting the word out. Like there's a ton of money available. Most of those are uncapped. So every single person in this room could get those tax credits and we wouldn't run out. Every single person in the country could get those tax credits. So it's getting that word out. And I think it's just making that implementation go up. As for promotion, stickers is our current plan. Maybe we'll buy some billboards if Derek and I want to throw some money at the wall. Just like CTA, you know, if anyone wants to throw us a few million, just let me know. Just my number is available. It's all part of my larger plan to turn you into a climate lobbyist, Victor, and it has succeeded wildly. <laughs> Hello, uh, we're going to fix some quick technical things, uh, but uh, my name is Amy. This is Vienne. We're going to talk about ghost buses. Um, if you've been coming to Chai Hack Night for the last couple months, you probably know that we're not typically the people who stand up here and talk about ghost buses, so just... Quickly up top, uh, Lori Merrill, who created this project and is probably watching at home. Hello, Lori. Uh, couldn't be here tonight, so we're going to be doing this on her behalf. Yeah, so uh, as Amy said, we're here representing the Ghost Buses group, of which there are several members here as well. And we want to start by laying out what's the problem? How did we get started um, with the Ghost Buses breakout group? This is how we got started. Throughout the pandemic, a lot of transit riders, um, ourselves included, have been noticing that the levels of service on the CTA trains and buses and transit have been seemingly less reliable. And sometimes what happens is you're looking at your phone where you might have a tracker of when the bus or train is about to come. And you know, you're about to go to work, you're about to go to a medical appointment that you need to be at, and you think a train or a bus is gonna come and then it just doesn't come kind of curious, can we get a small show of hands? Has this affected folks in the room? Pretty much everyone. <laughs> Pretty much everyone raised their hand. Yeah, it's yeah. a really pervasive problem, and it's been like talked about a lot in the media as well, which I think was part of the inspiration. <clears throat> yeah. Um, there have been reporters who have talked about it on the mainstream news media channels. Um, Block Club has shared uh, stories about it. Uh, it just news outlets in general. And so we started seeing this issue um, and a lot of articles being published. And 
Um, one in particular was an article by Streets Blog by um, someone who is affiliated with another group, Commuters Take Action, and they published initially a report that only about 50% of the blue line um, trains were running. So we saw this and we were like, whoa, that's, um, we, like, we, we thought it was bad, but that's even worse than we had kind of expected. And so Lori saw this, uh, who was the person who started the breakout group and announced it and asked if anybody would be interested in joining the group. And her day job is also in transit. So she works um, with the uh, data sets that are adjacent to the ones that we're using. So she started thinking about, okay, how can this possibly be applied to Chicago? Um, and then she pitched the group to uh, Chai Hack Night and said, is anybody interested in joining? And it turned out that there are so many people who are affected by the issue that folks started to say, hey, maybe this is something that I can work on and um, I could contribute to. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, uh, pretty much every transit agency in the country, especially larger ones, make all of the data that they use publicly available. So all of the stops data, all of the routes data, and in many cases, the real time data for buses that are actually on routes. Um, so we knew that the CTA has uh, real time bus tracking available through their API. And we also knew that they publish um, a schedule that they claim to be accurate. So essentially what this project does is um, compares the real-time bus tracking data by pinging the API like every five minutes to check where the buses are on the map and then compares that to the schedule to notice discrepancies. And, um, you know, this quote, every map of Chicago is the same map. Uh, one thing that we were sort of looking at when we started this project, you know, this city has a real history of, of discrepancies between neighborhoods in terms of like who's getting funding, who's getting opportunities, like whether or not services are being provided to the residents of those neighborhoods. Um, so we were very interested also to see whether or not this was another instance of that, whether or not, for example, the north side would have more bus service than the south side. <laughs> so what we did is we started to build a data architecture Taking in those two data sets, the data set of the actual um, buses that come in, also the scheduled data set, and we kind of built it from the ground up. We found uh, a, like a data storage uh, with Amazon Web Services, and I think it was S3, like simple storage, to put all the data inside. We were inspired by the CPS COVID dashboard that was done here at Chai Hack Night. So building on things that are already existing. And um, eventually what, uh, what we've been doing is we started to produce some data and to answer this question of what are um, the disparities potentially in the ghost buses that are happening across the city? What's the prevalence? What's the distribution? One of our members, Dylan, took some of the data and created a visualization. And so here in the visualization, what you see is that the yellow routes are the ones that um, have a ratio of actual to scheduled trips near one. So this is like 0.92 to one, right? So that one would be that there are exactly as many actual trips as there are scheduled trips, whereas like a, a ratio of 0.5 would mean that there's only half the amount of actual trips to the scheduled trips, right? So half of the buses are ghosting people. And then as you go down into orange, pink, um, and then the darker purples, you see that those ratios actually go down. So the, the, the bottom is actually 0.24 um, to 0.71. And so basically, you know, what you can see visually by looking at this map is, yeah, the service does uh, gradually get worse as you go further south down the city. Okay, also when we started this project, one of the things that we were thinking based on thinking about past civic tech projects that be what we've been working on is that it's really important um, for us to understand what's the ecosystem, what's the ecology of the organizations that are already working on some of these issues before we come in. The worst thing would be to come in without any connection to people being affected, even though we, we do ride transit. Um, so the worst thing would be coming in and not having any connection to the folks who are 
uh, like most directly affected by ghost buses. So we said, okay, what is the ecology? And what we started doing is over time, we started contacting different organizations that were involved in doing this work. So Communities Take Action right now is kind of at the forefront of doing political mobilizing. Um, they had a sticker campaign and uh, there's petitions that are kind of spread across different organizations that call for the mayor and for the CTA to take more action to um, alleviate the problem of ghost buses. And, you know, so there's them. There's also organizations like the Transit for All campaign that have longer term asks, like making a transit riders uh, union that's, you know, not just a couple months in the future, but is years um, kind of in the planning and in the making. And then we also connected to groups that are nationwide that do transit advocacy to understand, okay, so ghost buses, are, ghost buses are happening here, but actually they're happening all over the nation. It's a much deeper, much more widespread problem, partially because of the pandemic. And so we wanted to understand what is the context and what are other groups doing and um, how can we potentially learn from them um, to, to make the work that we're doing better. So for the actual technology that we're using, uh, separate from the data side, so uh, we're, uh, we're building the site mostly in React with Leaflet uh, for our mapping and SCSS for styling. Um, when it comes to like user experience on the site, there are a couple different things we wanted to consider. First of all, as most of you can tell by looking around at all of you who ride the CTA, most people probably have a couple bus lines that they're interested in knowing you know, like if I look up my bus line, how well is that bus line doing compared to the, the schedule that it's, you know, that they're publishing? Um, so we wanted to make sure that everyone could access like their buses schedule data. Um, but we also wanted to make it so that you could compare bus lines to one another and um, neighborhood groups to one another, because you might look at your bus and find that it's running like 80% of its scheduled trips and think that's really bad. <laughs> but then you might find out that that's like one of the best lines in the city. And then it's like, well, what's happening there? You know, um, one thing that we were really aware of is that it is a lot of data. The CTA has something like 127 bus lines. I should know that I think off the top of my head at this point. Um, it has a lot of bus lines. All of those bus lines run a lot of trips. Uh, and so we didn't want the experience to feel overwhelming. You know, we didn't want anyone to look on there and be like, well, this is way too much data. I'm not a data scientist. I'm just, you know, someone who's trying to figure out how the bus is doing. So that was another thing we also wanted to keep uh, in touch. So some of these things we are currently working on, some of them we have completed, but things like color mapping. So the map that Dylan generated earlier, making it so that you can look at the city as a whole and get a really good visual for how buses are performing across the city. Um, like I said, filtering by neighborhood and ward, seeing how your neighborhood is affected by this problem as opposed to other neighborhoods across the city and um, comparing the most dependable and le least dependable routes. Um, Another thing that we're kind of making a, a big push for right now um, is web accessibility, which I actually want to thank Victor because he sent me a lot of really good resources and advice about this problem. But um, one thing that he pointed out that I wanted to pull out and talk about is just that a lot of our work has to do with like seeing all of these bus routes on the map, but maps are traditionally actually very difficult when it comes to web accessibility. So figuring out other ways, and this might actually be news if you're in the ghost buses group, we are going to talk about this today, <laughs> um, but figuring out other ways of visualizing that data outside of a map. So different riders with different access to the internet will also be able to read those. Uh, Decarb My State does a lot of really cool stuff with that, and we're going to be stealing all of it. Um, <laughs> now, I actually think that we have like a demo. I, I actually think we do have a demo. I put it together. So, <laughs> so this is our home page. I'll just go ahead and refresh it because of the animation. Um, but I'm curious. So anyone in the room who currently takes the bus, is there a bus either by route name or route number that you would be interested in looking up. Okay, we have one right here in the green. 16, 60, 60, okay. So you can look these up by name and number right now. But if you look it up, you can kind of see, pull it up. This is all of the information about bus 60. So you can see all of this data right now is just based on weekday data. And I, because um, every single bus in the city with maybe one or two exceptions, runs on weekdays. So just for a starting point, we felt like that was a really good place to start to be able to compare all the bus lines. But our eventual goal is to also be 
to be able to compare uh, weekend and holiday data as well. Um, I will also note that generally what we're finding is that weekday trips are running more reliably than weekend trips. So just something to consider when you look at these numbers. Um, so this bus line, you can see services a little over 6,000 per, per weekday. Um, it's, this is a little bit misworded. It's, it's performing better than 30% of the buses. So not one of our best and, <laughs> and one in every five buses is ghosting CTA riders. And then we also have the, the bus ranking as well, just out of all 127 bus lines, where does this bus fall? Um, this is a visual bug. So I'm just going to keep making it of that. Um, anyone else? A bus line right here? Western. Western. Okay. Western. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, this one is actually doing a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> it's doing a little bit better. It definitely services more people. Um, falling in. Oh, it's actually, I think, maybe doing... I forget what the last one was. But you can see the same set of data just generated... Um, depending on which bus line you click. And I will say also, for example, my bus is the 22 bus. If you want to, you can also click directly on the map to get this information. And I can't, oh, there it is. So there you go. So you can also go through, click as well. Um, Long-term, our goals are, like I said, to add more filtering availability. So you'll be able to like, down here, like uh, filter by ward, uh, by the 10 best bus lines, by the 10 worst bus lines, and then also some other stuff that we are thinking about right now. So if you have ideas on the best way to filter buses or questions that you have that you would like represented on the map, uh, join our breakout group. Also, most immediately, so like when you see, oh my God, like my bus is in, um, you know, it's, it's performing like this, um, better than this percentage of buses or like two out of five of the buses on my road are ghosting people. Um, in terms of like connecting to the broader political effort, what we're trying to do is from that to ask people to contact their representatives. And um, that's why we have filtering by ward, I think, and, and by area, because then you can literally like email the person. Um, oh, great. <laughs> just while you're talking yeah, about it, go in, ahead. in your ward and to try to put more pressure on the CTA to get political action going. It says sign the petition and actually there was a petition and it's almost fulfilled right now. Um, but that doesn't mean that more voices cannot make it um, stronger. And then that also spills over. So um, that's how like you can help based on the data that you see on the website. Uh, the website launch, we have loose plans to launch, if not next week, then the week after something again that we're going to be talking about today. If you want to come, uh, to our ghost bus breakout meeting right after this, uh, new data and features. I mean, as we talked about, we have a lot of different ideas for things that we want to add to the map, uh, research that we want to add to the website. Um, and most importantly, everyone is welcome. So if you have any experience that you think could be helpful here, if you are a transit writer and you feel like, you know, you just want to go and vent, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a great space for that. Um, and then also, if you are someone who is looking for long-term updates on this project, we are on Twitter at Ghost Buses. So uh, you can find us there. And I think that's all we have. That's it. So we can take maybe questions if anyone has any. Um, I have a question around how you're measuring how a bus is ghosting uh, or a bus is, is not reliable. Um, do you measure it at the start of the route or at the end of the route? Or how, how, where do you measure whether a bus was actually, you know, it, it didn't actually take that route? And second, um, how, how long are you waiting until, the, until you consider it a missed bus? You know, if the schedule says 8.10, and the bus is actually postponed until like 8.15. Do you consider that a, a ghost bus? That is a great question for Lori. Um, <laughs> actually, Dylan, do you know the answer to that? There we go. Um, less of, uh, like, I guess, looking at the individual um, buses is more or less um, looking, like, I guess, counting the number of um, distinct trips on a route that actually happened. And then just comparing that count to what the schedule said um, was going to be the total number of trips for that day on that particular route. 
Um, so I don't think it's necessarily tracking the specific vehicle um, at that time. But, um, Another thing to say is this is a really great question. Um, in this first iteration, when we were trying to say, okay, what is the what is the most direct number we can start to give people and that we can build right away that will give them a sense of the ghost buses phenomena. And as Dylan said, like over a certain time window, how many of the buses are happening versus how many are scheduled. That's just a basic number. We have also like, we've also been talking about actually tracking a, a particular bus in its start and its end time. So um, then, then actually seeing when it like drops off. So that we are think those kinds of questions we are absolutely thinking about um, after we release and launch the website next week. And that would be like the second iteration of, okay, so now we understand at a high level how bad the problem is. Let's get a little bit deeper into it. Um, and we welcome, ex you know, um, volunteering expertise for anybody who's interested in exploring these sorts of um, questions. With us. Great. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Burns. This is Sarta Chaudhry, uh, and we are presenting Civi. Civi is a social network uh, designed to enhance communication between residents and elected officials and also among residents themselves. A uh, bit of background, um, Sartaj has been building apps and cool stuff uh, as a software engineer for about 10 years. I am an attorney by trade. Uh, did a career shift um, to get into politics a couple years ago, ran for Congress, and was the campaign manager for a local campaign last year, uh, and am getting into tech myself now. Uh, so um, with the head in the clouds, feet on the ground approach, we are dreaming big, right? We want to redefine how government works. How do you talk to your legislature? Um, we want to revolutionize politics. Um, eventually, one day, 20 years down the line, a path towards a direct democracy so we don't need politicians at all, right? Uh, but we are starting small and manageable, and basically we are just building a civics-focused fo social media site where there are only humans, right? So no companies, no ads, uh, and verification, not only that you are a person, but that you have an address. Um, not that we're going to publish your address, but um, we want to have geographically sensitive polling um, so that, uh, for example, a politician can know if he's asking, if they're asking a question about something that they're voting on, that these are my actual constituents who live in my area. Um, and then we want to build that and then get buy-in from local elected officials and then go from there. Politics is kind of a, a dirty word in a lot of ways, and one of the reasons is it's very confusing and there's a lot of definitions for it. I like Robin Williams uh, from poly, a Latin word meaning many, and ticks meaning blood-sucking creatures. Uh, it's a fun definition. It's a pretty accurate definition, uh, depending on uh, you know who you talk to. Um, maybe a more succinct and simple one uh, is George Bush's, uh, clarification that he is the decider. He decides what's best. And at its core, that's what politics is, right? It's who makes the decision, right? How much do we spend here? How much do we spend here? What's legal? What's not illegal? What do we enforce? What do we not enforce? Right? Uh, it comes down to power. And so one of my favorite kind of ways of thinking about this was, uh, from a book called, uh, Sur about surveillance, uh, capitalism, and the author laid, laid out uh, the study of power with these three questions, right? You have to ask three questions when you're thinking about power. Who decides, right? In our system, that's the elected officials. Who decides who decides? In our system, that is the voters. And then who knows what is going on? And in our system, um, well-informed is in quotes. Obviously, we're in a truth-deprived uh, era, right, where there's a lot of ambiguity just around basic facts. Uh, but the general idea is just knowing what's going on is powerful in itself. And then you've got everyone else. One more uh, way of thinking about our system, right, is we've got the voters, they elect the politicians, and then the politicians make the decisions for us, right? And you only vote every two years um, or every four years or every six years, depending on the office. And so our long-term dream is to make a system where... Um, you can kind of have proxies, right? So if somebody runs for office and they say, I'm going to run for office, but once I'm in there, I'm going to be polling my constituents every month or every week or whatever they decide. 
And however they tell me to vote, I'm just going to vote that, right? I'm going to put my brain on a shelf and just do what you tell me. I will be your proxy. So that's kind of, again, long-term thinking somewhere that this could go. Um, this right here is um, just how the Athenians did direct democracy, right? And they had a cool idea of basically randomly selecting people to this upper council that then um, set the agenda on how things work, right? So this is just to show that there are historical models for direct democracy and how it works. If they could figure it out 2,000 years ago, um, you know, with not a lick of technology, there's something there that we can build towards or at least be thinking about. So the specific problem that uh, we're trying to address is the idea that right now we don't have an effect on those decisions that get made, right? This was uh, from a research paper published about 10 years ago that found that the average citizen has a near zero impact on the decisions that actually get made, right? So those circles that I showed over earlier, that's really just on paper. And even those arrows of the making the decisions, that's really just on paper. At the end of the day, what the average person wants does not make it into the policy in the United States of America. So that is our problem. So who decides? Mr. Monopoly Man is the guy pulling the strings, right? Unless you can hire an army of lobbyists, unless you can make donations to a political campaign, unless you can get those meetings with those high level officials, your opinion isn't affecting policy, right? Um, looking at the climate debate, right? I think everyone in this room agrees that climate is a huge problem, that we should be doing something about it, right? But is anything substantive being done, right? IRA is great. It's a step in the right direction. But I think we can all agree that we want more. We want to be doing a lot more, right? So um, again, there's the, the picture that's painted for us and then the reality, which is a little bit different. So why don't politicians listen? Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. One is the minimum feedback, right? You elect somebody into office and then they've got two years where they don't have to listen to you at all, right? We don't have uh, recall elections in the United States. We don't have uh, any other way to really dialogue with them. Um, in the places where we do, uh, there's a lot of other problems, right? The squeaky wheel that makes the most noise is the one that they're going to listen to. The person with the money is the one that they're going to listen to. Even the most well-meaning politician is going to have trouble sifting through the noise, right? They're getting robocalls to their office. They're getting mass emails to their office. Um, and they, you know, the media environment, again, is oversaturated with a lot of noise and different things. So even if they wanted to listen, they don't have a good way to connect. They can pay for polls, right? Which is one thing that a lot of politicians do, but those polls are usually geared toward how am I going to get elected next, right? They're not geared toward what is, what should I vote on this particular thing? And so that's, um, it's, it's an informational gap that um, we are trying to address. Why don't we do something about it? Uh, organizing is difficult, right? Anyone who's ever worked on a campaign knows that it's really hard. Um, Anyone who's ever been on Twitter knows that it's really hard to, you know, have a constructive dialogue, right? When you're limited to those characters, you can't really have a constructive dialogue. So uh, a lot of reasons why it's hard for us to organize and get our voices heard. Um, combine that with why it's difficult for the politicians to listen. And you've got, again, our opinions not making it into those decisions of how we want to do things. So I am going to... Pass it off now to Sartash for a tech demo. So we made a quick uh, demo recently. Uh, this specific page, actually, um, a lot of the sources and data and inspiration can be, uh, I can definitely thank Derek for helping make Councilmatic a long time ago. And also, um, he worked on a project where he was able to use Google's uh, Civic Information API to find data on all the representatives we have. So um, on this website, I can type in an address. Um, Specifically, I'm going to go with Chicago right now because what, what I was able to do is um, show a list of your representatives based on your address. And also, uh, if it's Chicago specifically, shows a list of the active resolutions that are happening. Uh, these are specifically uh, non-routine active resolutions. Um, city councils deal with a lot of things that most of us uh, would not be interested in, just like you know, basic need to change a road sign or something like that. Um, you can see everything at the city level, county level, um, state level, and national level. Um, but specifically, we want to focus on city level. So this was like the first 
proof of concept that we had. And then um, we wanted to go into saying, okay, what does this look like if we were able to get a representative that actually signed up and partnered with us and was willing to um, listen to their constituents and in a way where they actually actively listen for you know, this amendment that's happening on the chairman, like they want to know what's, what their constituents think about it. Um, so as a quick fake demo, uh, we were thinking there would be um, some sort of website like uh, page like this, probably wouldn't look like this. I am not proud of this design. I made this very quickly. Um, but uh, uh, the idea is there could be different kinds of polls that are happening. Those polls would be specifically based on uh, active resolutions or active things or real things that are being worked on. Uh, we don't really want um, politicians or people to be able to leverage this to uh, make hot takes like, oh, they want to get an opinion because, uh, you know, everything from Twitter to Facebook is out there for that. Uh, we want to specifically focus on official things that are happening, like real things that they're actually dealing with. So you'd be able to um, vote, um, for example, like you want to add a dedicated bike lane to Halstead. Um, let's say I say yay, but maybe other people don't. Um, and then you can vote would get submitted. Uh, and then for those that know how to fake stuff, I'm faking this. Um, uh, then later on, you'd get to see the poll results um, from all the constituents. And when you look at this data, you would know that the people that voted here are people that are in the older person's district. Um, it wouldn't be anyone outside of that. So the hope is that this data would be um, one of the more reliable sources of what your actual neighbors are thinking. We want to make it easy for residents to know what issues that are actually on the table. Right now, it's very hard to know what uh, city council or your state legislator, anybody is actually working on what, like, you know, they'll, again, they'll have hot takes on Twitter all day, but is that actually the thing that's showing up at their desk? Is that actually the thing they're going to be voting on soon? That's a little harder to figure out. Um, we want to focus on having topical civil social interactions. Um, and what we mean by that is um, we're not sure from a UX perspective whether we're going to have things like comment sections or um, other kinds of free text areas yet, because those are areas that are ripe for kind of abuse. And um, as we design this, we really want to think about the most abusive characters being on there and not being able to abuse it. Um, and we want to make, and as a result, we're hoping that voices are, uh, there's more signal in the noise, in the, in the voices and, and less noise. Um, and in order to partner with um, representatives and elective officials, we want to you know, make sure they also get value from this. Uh, they're going to get verified, like they're going to get feedback, we're hoping, from verified constituents. The people that are voting are not just, again, random people on Twitter. Um, Elon would not be able to message the older person. Uh, and you'd be able to get real feedback and, and real polling data. And uh, for those, what I've learned in the, in the political world, what I've learned is getting like reliable poll data is very expensive and also like very useful. So this is hopefully going to give them that value. As a differentiator, like you could recreate this thing again similarly on Facebook or as a subreddit or another kind of social media, but there is no way to verify the people that are voting are the people that are actually in your constituency. Um, and there's again, there's way too many ways on those networks. Like those are by nature reactionary. Um, you know, they make money off of attention. Uh, and our hope is that we design the social network with no intention of. Really, we don't intend to make this a for-profit thing at all, um, and we don't intend to make it make design decisions that would make it uh, where attention is necessary. Um, so our next step is to create a functional polling system, not just a fake demo like what I made, um, and also to find elected officials to pilot with. Uh, we want to. We hope that from the very beginning, we are finding um, partnerships of actual local officials that um, and see what they would want to do. Uh, and what, how they would hopefully want this polling system to go. We're also hoping to uh, talk to um, people in uh, the elected officials' constituency and, and see what they would want and kind of build it as a, as a partnership with the community. Um, and then beyond that, um, my intention is to probably throw away all the code we wrote and then uh, build an actual robust system. So right now it's all just about proving the interactions. Um, there's a lot of ways we can go with, from the robust system. We can go decentralized. We can go... Um, uh, all, honestly, I don't want to dive too deep, deep into the tech of it, but uh, it's kind of nice to be able to build an MVP that we don't intend to keep building on top of later.
uh, and how we can um, get some help from y'all. Um, we would love helping, getting help, partnering with elected officials. Um, anyone out there that's interested in whether it's uh, you know school board people or alder people or um, county officials, et cetera, um, anyone that's willing to work with us that's an elected official, if you, if you think you have a way to kind of make those connections, that would be amazing. Um, UX design, um, would love to get people that um, kind of love UX, not just from a visual design standpoint, but a how do these design decisions uh, impact human behavior on the website. Um, uh, blockchain and distributed systems uh, would love to see if there's a way to make this a more trustworthy data source. Um, maybe that is just going with a centralized database. Maybe that's going with a decentralized database. Would love to have those conversations with people that uh, care about that stuff probably more than me. Um, I'm more of a front end developer. Uh, and then, yeah, a white paper working group. We want to make sure that the theory and the fundamentals and values behind what we're doing are sound and we can like stick to that over the course of a long period of time. Um, and then yeah, if anybody likes front end, um, yeah, would love to collab. Uh, that's it, questions. Hi, um, so this is a really cool idea, but I was, and I know that you're very early on in the stages of it, but I was curious if you had, um, had an idea for how to deal with the fact that social media is very self-selecting when you're dealing with stuff like polls for like, who like what your older person should vote on if the population is self-selecting? I was wondering if you had thought at all about that. Uh, to make sure I understand what you're saying, when you say self-selecting, you mean people that are interested in the poll are the ones that vote on the poll? I guess I mean more generally, like people who are interested in being on social media at all. Like I think that they're yeah. Yeah, no, I mean that is a a serious problem. Um, there is both a combination of. Um, it depends on the environment you're in. Like in a, in a city like Chicago, there is a high reach of a lot of social networks. Um, they're not the same social networks. Some people are on TikTok, some people are on Facebook. I'm not on either. Um, but I do hope that, um, it's a very good question, honestly. Uh, and it's something that is going to be a very critical part of, I think, our growth and how we, uh, like, how do we get, you know, I know we can get, for example, people like business owners. Business owners are always wanting to talk to their older people. They're always wanting to figure out how to fix, um, oh, how do we get this road fixed? Or, you know, there's, they love talking about the different kind of crime issues, but then how do we get someone that is working, you know, two jobs and doesn't have time to actually like, vote on that poll? I, it is definitely something that we want to invest serious effort into. Um, we don't have a solution yet. And one one thought that we had on that is leveraging those those early like local political you know um, champions right. So if we can get one older person, they have the lists of you know the people who write them and the people who reach out to them often, and kind of leveraging those. Um, we had also thought of like having combining like a, a live aspect of it, right? So if the older person can um, advertise for a town hall, right, and so then you can come in. You don't necessarily need to have the app. To participate in that so yeah, there's a lot of ways that we're exploring that for sure all right thank you so much